Hello and welcome to the second video for the online Argon workshop Object Photogrammetry for Archaeology. In the previous video, I gave an overview of the hardware that you need. In this video, we will look in more detail into the most important piece of hardware, the photo camera. The first simple thing that you should realize is that the sharper and more detailed your photos are, the more detailed and accurate your model will be. So even if you can use any camera for photogrammetry, better cameras and well-balanced settings create better models. The hardware parts of the camera that are important are the lens and the light-sensitive sensor, referred to as CMOS or CCD, two different types of sensor. In the category of settings we have aperture, ISO, shutter speed and white balance. We will discuss these elements and settings one by one. Where old analog photo cameras of the past had a photosensitive film inside it to fixate light, a digital camera has a sensor. This sensor consists of thousands of tiny photocytes light-sensitive elements that transmit a signal that is converted to pixels. This is where the well-known but little understood megapixels come into play. Generally, you would say, the more photocytes, the better. However, if these photocytes are crammed on a very small sensor, they must be reduced in size, which makes their performance worse than when the same number of larger photocytes are placed on a larger sensor. Due to the tiny sensor size in your phone, its megapixels are worse quality than a camera with a larger sensor, even if it has the same number of megapixels. Phones therefore generally rely on clever post-processing image algorithms to improve the sharpness and clarity of your pictures. This kind of post-processing and constantly improving sensor technology makes that modern phone cameras produce decent photogrammetic models nowadays. Professional cameras often have so-called full-frame sensor, the golden standard for sensor size, the size equivalent of the old 35mm film. They allow for much more nuance in light capture and therefore more subtle detail. For projects which require top quality and highly detailed models, a full frame camera is still recommendable. The camera I have been working with over the last few years is this Nikon D5300. It is a mid-range camera with a so-called APS-C sensor, a reasonably sized sensor, but not full frame. Next is the lens, which is probably the most important part of your camera. There are many aspects of lens construction that determine its quality, which causes them to range in price so immensely. The main technical properties of the lens are focal length and the maximum aperture, which are usually written on the lens itself. The focal length is the distance of the optical center of the lens to the sensor of the camera. Due to how optics work, the shorter the focal length, the larger the field of view, but the less magnification. The longer the focal length, the smaller the field of view, and the more magnification. Lenses with a short focal length are called wide-angle lenses and have more distortion on the edges. Every lens has distortions like this, but at the extreme, this causes the so-called fish-eye effect. Even though photogrammetic software is generally able to correct for most lens distortions, more accurate results can be acquired with lenses that have less distortion. In terms of focal length, 35mm or 50mm are ideal for object photogrammetry. Many cameras come with standard lenses with an adjustable focal range. For instance, this one has a focal range of 18 to 55 millimeters. This allows the user to zoom in on the subject. Originally, these were unusable for photogrammetry because lenses were manually calibrated and changing the focal length 
would mess up the calibration. Nowadays, software takes care of the calibration using known lens properties. Nevertheless, fixed focal lenses are still preferable because they generally deliver sharper pictures and perform better with low light. Macro lenses, often used for insect or botanical photography, can capture extreme detail of small objects. They allow you to make models of tiny things. However, I personally have never worked with microphotogrammetry. The aperture is the opening through which light passes in the lens. The larger this opening, the more light can pass, which allows you to photograph in dimmer conditions. It also makes a sharper image and can be used to create pleasing photographic effects with a focused foreground and a soft and blurry background. So more expensive lenses generally have a larger maximum aperture. However, the problem with large apertures is that they have a smaller depth of field, as illustrated in this picture. Although aesthetically pleasing, if parts of your subject are unsharp, these parts are less usable for photogrammetry. This can be cause for noise and inaccuracy in the model. With the aperture of the lens, we have already moved into the domain of adjustable camera settings. In photogrammetry, your primary goal is to create as little variation as possible between the settings of the different photographs. You should find a setting that is right and stick to it as long as you can in a single project. Hence, shooting in automatic mode is generally not recommendable, although it may give you fine results nonetheless. Note that shooting with constant camera settings is helped by ensuring constant light conditions, which is discussed in the next video. When referring to camera settings, we mainly refer to the exposure triangle, shutter speed, aperture and ISO, or light sensitivity. They are fixed in a triangular relationship because if you change any of the settings, the others need to be adjusted in order to maintain the same exposure or lightness of your image. However, if you adjust any of them without adjusting the others, the image will become darker or lighter. So generally, you first choose an aperture in which your entire subject, the archaeological artifact, is in focus. If this causes the image to become dark, you must increase the shutter time or the ISO. ISO determines the light sensitivity of your sensor, or the photo sites I mentioned before. It has a numerical value that ranges from 50 to 12,000 or even further. On the image you can see the effect of increasing the ISO value without changing any other value in the exposure triangle. But increasing ISO to brighten the image comes at a cost, as it will introduce noise, as you can see here. Therefore you should try to maintain an ISO of 400 or less, although you may be able to go higher on more expensive cameras. It is nevertheless preferable to first increase shutter time before adjusting the ISO. This is where a tripod comes in handy, as with longer shutter times, Absolutely no movement of the camera is allowed to prevent motion blur. The last setting that you should take note of is white balance. How you perceive white in reality depends on the color temperature of the light. The more yellow the light, the more yellow the whites. Cameras can compensate for this effect. You can let your camera decide the appropriate white balance for your environment, but it does it not always perfectly. For full control, better set it manually. It is important that you do this in your studio setup, so you can get the most accurate results. Some cameras allow you to set the color temperature of the light manually to, let's say, 6000 degrees Kelvin. This number should correspond to the degrees of the light used in your studio. If there are no other light sources that add light to your setup, 
entering this number in your camera should create perfectly neutral white on the pictures. My own camera allows me to capture a piece of white paper, on the basis of which it automatically calculates the appropriate white balance. Finally, take the time to experiment with your camera and settings so you fully understand what they do. Also, it is not always possible to take optimal photographs. Sometimes environmental conditions or the dimensions or shape of the object force you to create a suboptimal dataset. In such cases, manual tweaking or masking of photos may be required. However, computer vision algorithms or photogrammatic software become better all the time. Difficult photo sets of 10 years ago may be a piece of cake for current photogrammatic software. This was the second video in the series Object Photogrammetry for Archaeology. You should now have an idea of camera settings and in what way they are important to photogrammetic projects. In the next video, we will discuss the process of photographing an archaeological object, step by step. Thank you for paying attention and see you in the next video.